when we leased our office space, which is across the street, and we went into our eighth floor office, and we looked out the window at the site, and we saw kids playing on the roof, we all took a collective, uh-oh. There's a preschool that is 20 feet from our project, and we have an 800-foot tall building being built 20 feet away from them. The roof of the building is the playground for these kids. Needless to say, if you have kids, it's a frightening thought. Literally, a cell phone or a, you know, it, it could be a coffee cup, it could be anything. Well, it could kill somebody. The, the wheels start turning. How are we going to do this? We have to protect these kids. I came to San Francisco with my girlfriend at the time. And I was just starting in the business. I was just a pup. And I looked at her and I told her, I said, someday I'm going to build a high rise in San Francisco. You say it, you never really necessarily believe it's going to happen. So when that opportunity came, I jumped at it. I uh, didn't have any idea what the building was. I knew it was a high rise, but for all I knew, it was a very simple, straightforward box. And it's anything but. It's a complicated building. The, the geometry of the structure is nowhere near straightforward. I've never even heard what his thought process was. I wish I could have talked to him at the time and said, would you just straighten it up for us? But um, because of the design, I mean, Jeffrey, it's his little baby. It's, you know, he is, um, I think, more attached to this building than anything he's ever done, as are we. So I go by and I'm taking pictures and I'm in my suit, you know, and they, Every now and then, one of them come over to me and they say, who are you? And I say, oh yeah, I'm the architect. And they go, oh, this is so exciting. This is the best job I've ever worked on. You know, you can go build a lot of buildings and you don't think about them a lot. This one, you'll think about, you know, till the end of your career and beyond. The international exposure has really transformed my design instincts. And, and this building came out of that. It was influenced by the Bank of China building. It was influenced by Foster's uh, Hong Kong Shanghai building in Hong Kong as well, but also by the John Hancock building in Chicago and others. The other part, though, was all of the adventurous things that were happening in design in China, like uh, Rem Koolhaas doing the CCTV and so on. San Francisco's always been a bit stodgy, and it, it was the perfect opportunity to do something that was more global. And the city's become more global, so it all happened at once. The first rendering I saw of it, I was like, holy cow, this thing's crazy. There was no straight corners on it. Every floor was a different size, a different shape. All the things just blast through your mind right away. The building is extremely tall and thin. And therefore, as a cantilever sticking out of the ground, it's got to be very strong because it has to resist earthquake, it has to resist wind. How is it all emergency? Yes, ma'am. Well, I've been through a few earthquakes in the city and in the region. I was here for the Loma Prieta, which was about a 7.1. And the, the earthquake scale is geometric. So the 1906 earthquake, I believe, was about an 8.4, okay? So that's not just going from seven to eight, that's about a thousand times stronger. You have to experience an earthquake to understand the force of it. And this building is a true expression of responding to a major global seismic uh, tectonic event. The building is designed that in the event of a 500 year 8.0 earthquake, that the building is reoccupiable the next day. So in terms of its innovation and strength, it's very far advanced. So when you look at the building, you can kind of think earthquake. You know, it's the visual embodiment of dealing with earthquake. We found that we couldn't put any loads. We couldn't bear posts down on top of there because the building was historic. So we decided to come up and build an even taller scaffold. And we draped a net right there over the kids. With the children actively playing on the roof, definitely uh, created a unique challenge for, for myself, being a dad. So we, we took a look at it. Initially, I thought I could put some, some loads bearing down on top of the roof and just put a cover over it. 
the building was historic. I looked at some of the steps and we, we owe it to protect historical buildings. And through the process of um, approvals through the historical committee, they did not want me placing those loads on the roof. We decided to engineer and test a canopy system that would never touch the building but would protect the kids on top. So I came up with a plan to cantilever the structure out over the top of the roof using a very similar uh, design technique like a gantry crane. We created a canopy between their building and our building that is supported off structure and then cantilevers out over the top of the entire daycare roof. We did drop tests that would that showed that we could drop up to 350 pounds into the net and it would survive numerous falls. It's not cheap. Um, uh, I would say it's nowhere near the cost of someone's life though. How do you put a price on a life? And, and wh whenever someone asks me that question, I say, if it, there, was, there is no limit. That's where we come up with, there is no limit to the funds. If it costs one and a half million, two million dollars, versus I know someone's not gonna get hurt, you're spending the money. Take. Wait, 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 wait. Wait. Yeah, this is an emergency in San Francisco. What happened? Uh, there's a hell of an earthquake, and we've got uh, windows and everything that's falling out. We've got a hell of a dust cloud. Oh my God, we're having an earthquake. Wait a minute. Hold on. Hold on. Here in San Francisco, we're on the ring of fire and there's just these giant shifting plates and it's that shifting which creates the earthquake and they're not going away. Every time there's an earthquake in California, the codes kick up a notch, every time. Even if there's not collapse, there's the danger of fire, there's the danger of buildings shedding their skin elements onto the street. I, I, I think the safety and the resiliency beyond safety where the building survives it nicely is a big deal. The original um, concept for the structural design of this building was such that it was a very stiff building and it didn't have resiliency. So resiliency to the industry means that the building is resilient enough so that, that it will be functioning even after an earthquake event. You have to go through a seismic peer review process. You have to prove to the city that the building will function. And when you go to gold standard resiliency, you're taking it one step further and saying, not only will it just not topple down, but it, it, you'll be able to occupy it very quickly after. The footprint's 15,400 square feet, which is next to nothing. Um, it created the, the most unique challenge of 181, which was the aspect ratio of the job, its height versus how much width on the bottom. Traditional method, I, I would say, would be a, a cast in place center core. If you look at the Salesforce Tower, it's a, got a huge concrete core, which is where all the elevators are and some of the bathrooms and things like that for the building. So that concrete core is what gives that building its stiffness, which is fine if you have the room to build your building stiff. So if you were to build that wall system here, you would take away literally so much property within the footprint of the building, you almost wouldn't have any leasable space. That's, that's the, the driver. The decision was made to go with a different structural engineer, different ideas, lighten the building up, get the structure smaller. And this all relates back to the seismic zone that we're in. Um, and that's what drove the exoskeleton design. And when I say exoskeleton, obviously the, the main seismic structure sits outboard of the frame itself, outboard of the slabs where it's intended to. The exoskeletal aspect of the building uh, means we don't have to have any interior columns until you get to the elevators and, the, and the, the central core. But the core is just a functioning core. It's not a, so much of a structural core. And it makes the floor by floor more efficient, which is important because this floor plate is not so big. It's a tight site. What allowed us to do that were the mega braces. Arup came in with uh, their idea of the shock absorbers. So uh, that was actually a very powerful idea because it took the design to a whole nother level. So the design didn't change, it's the same design we did, but it made it lighter and more seismically resilient. And by making it lighter, it became way more efficient. So the amount of steel in the building is, is much lower. 
They say they could build a 29-story building with the steel they saved. It's very impressive. So when you see the big pins and the BRBs, the shock absorbers, the viscous dampers that are on all the big braces, those weren't there before. Those were big stiff members that didn't move. Our particular mega brace you don't see anywhere in the city. The building basically is a big shock absorber and it can move a lot and still be occupiable. You can get back in, even if it's just to get paperwork or get your personal belongings, whatever, you can go back in the building. Most of these buildings, they won't let you in. They'll close them up and until you're released to go back in, everything just sits here. You can imagine how many buildings would have to be inspected. I think for tall buildings, it's one of the safest uh, probably in the world. I knew that by doing the structure we were doing, we would be further along. But by taking it to the next level with the shock absorbers and, and, and that aspect of it, uh, it's now become iconic as a structural statement as well as hopefully as an architectural statement. To date, we've worked two and a half million hours, man hours, without a lost time injury. They're passionate about it. I mean, it's not a joke, it's not luck. You know, you don't work two and a half million man hours and just be lucky. There's, there's something behind it, and it, it has to do with the training, the culture, the thought process, the planning. Everything that we do is about keeping people safe. I've seen people injured, I've seen people not here, I've seen what it does to families, what it does to careers. Back in the, in the early days, for me, it was, uh, there was a lot of screaming and yelling and, you know, just get your ass moving, you know, we gotta get this done. And, you know, this is, this is tough work and, and there's a lot expected from you. And in order to get them to embrace what we do and what we want them to do, you have to kind of treat them like your own kids, you know? You know, they just went bowling a couple weeks ago We've gone on big golf outings where I take the whole team out. You become a big family. I mean, we will have been on this project for most of us for four years when it's done. That's a long time. That's like going to college. And you, you sit down and you talk to them. You, you try to do things with them. And we all have outside things going on. There's no question. We've all got bills to pay. We've all got this. We've all got that. So at the end of the day, you try to bring them into the fold because if you've got 10 engineers working for you, Eight of them are cruising through life and enjoying everything they do. Two of them are struggling here, they're struggling there. And so you try to help me, you know, you make them part of the team. I've had workers leave to go, let's say, for more money, more hours, and, and literally come back within a few weeks because they didn't feel protected. Um, so generally speaking, you are going to get better quality hands and, and, and a better camaraderie out in the field if you run a clean, quality, safe job. That, that's just the way I see it. The thought process is every single day we send every one of our guys home to his family. San Francisco has been a small city, charming and wonderful, and I love living here, but um, a small city with, with kind of more uh, introverted thinking about itself and about design. In the last decade, everything has gone global about it, the, the technology jobs, the new museum, the investment from overseas going to a new high. And I think it excites people to see that sense of change. And I think this building embodies that global change. As the job goes on, I give more and more credit both to the contractors and to uh, J. Paul Company because, you know, they're letting it get built the way it was envisioned. And you probably know that very often that doesn't happen, that everything gets watered down. Nothing's got watered down here. It's just great. There's so much that goes into it aside from just, you know, nails and sticks and plaster. You know, it's, a, it's just an amazing process. It's gonna have an extra, hold an extra special place in my, uh, my heart and my memories because my wife is involved in the project from the owner's side. My daughter is an engineer who works for me. My future son-in-law is an engineer who works for me. They, we all have this big, beautiful building in common and can talk about it the rest of our lives. And people are usually pretty amazed that the whole damn family's building this building. It's crazy. It's just beginning to get to a meaningful height on the skyline. And I think that every day it becomes more and more visible. So one of the places you really see it now is the Bay Bridge. It's very prominent uh, 
looking out the windows of, from the new SF MoMA Museum. You can see it right there, right, right out there. That was a new surprise. I think I'll have to wait until the enclosure is done to see how it really looks, but it's, it's starting to look really good. Um, I'll definitely describe it as one of the first um, where all of us came together, had a great time, and, and just enjoyed it. This is one of those jobs where from the, the food during lunch break to the ride home is, is just awesome. Thank you very much for an excellent job. You've built the most magnificent project, one of the hardest structures that we have ever seen, and I've done this for 25 years. So give yourselves a round of applause and get yourself a second plate. Thank you. Topping out is great. It's the achievement of the workers doing what is really the most dramatic part, which is the erection of the steel or the structure to its full height. They're all invited to sign uh, the, the last beam that's gonna go up. Now, the significance of that, it's a way of just putting their mark, saying, hey, we were part of this. In, and it's a pride thing. It's a, you're part of something big. This is such a, a significant job. How many buildings have been built like this? And we've done it safely, and we're, you know, we're really proud of that. I have to say that for all the work we've done in the past, and the work in the city, and, and all the other buildings that have been done here, that this building really represents the true, new, adventurous, global San Francisco. It uh, demonstrates to people that this building is uniquely made to address the nature of San Francisco and it's expressed in the design. So this will stand out and it'll always stand out. It is truly a, a, a memorable project and something that's incredibly special to us and always will be.